Could black holes collapse directly in the early universe? When galaxies collide, how do their stars stay together? How would we communicate time to an alien civilization? All this and more in this week's question show. It's time once again for the question show your questions, my answers. Now, as always, wherever you are across my channel, if you're watching the video and you see the YouTube comments down below, just ask a question in there. That's how I find them. I'll gather a bunch of them up and I will answer them here. But we also do this show live every Monday at 5pm Pacific. So if you want to come and ask your questions live, see follow on questions, stick around for the overtime. We do this show every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific. All right, let's get into the questions. Scott Bringlow 6408. Love the podcast. I was reading about direct collapse black holes, and I was wondering if you can give an overview of the theory. Sure. So we have black holes here in the universe today. We have two kinds of black holes. We have the stellar mass black holes and we have the supermassive black holes. And the stellar mass black holes, they are formed when giant stars explode and they form this black hole as part of the process. The supermassive black holes, astronomers aren't entirely sure where they came from, but they can be millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. And the farther back in time that astronomers look with more and more powerful telescopes like JWST, they're able to see that these supermassive black holes were present at the hearts of galaxies, even within the first billion years of the universe. And the big question that astronomers have is like, what came first, these giant black holes or the galaxies that they're in? And how do you get a black hole with millions of times the mass of the sun so soon after the Big Bang itself? And there's a bunch of theories. One is that just regular stellar mass black holes found each other, merged, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually you're just left with these really enormous black holes. It's kind of exponential doubling as two black holes meet and then two more black holes meet and those black holes meet and very quickly you find your way to these enormous black holes. But another idea is that the seeds of these supermassive black holes formed early on directly out of the gas that was left over from the Big Bang, the primordial hydrogen and helium. And so unlike the process where you've got this giant star that has to go through its life for a couple of million years, then it's got to die, explode as a supernova and the core collapses into a black hole, you could have some over density of hydrogen and helium in the early universe, where the gas sort of swirls in collects in this area. And it is enough material in this spot that it's able to collapse directly and turn into a black hole. And this is the direct collapse black hole. But the challenge is that as you bring this material together, and as it gets closer and closer and closer, it starts to heat up. And that process of heating up will cause this outward pressure that's going to stop this material from being able to come down. And so the big challenge in astronomy is to figure out a way that you can actually remove heat from the process that you can somehow cool this cloud to keep it from being able to puff up and prevent the process of turning into the black hole. And you know, this is still an ongoing series of research right now, but it appears that in certain conditions, you can have gas strip heat away from the larger cloud of gas where the black hole is going to eventually form. And you've got some kind of balance that you can strike. Now, if this theory is true, there should be some evidence of these early direct collapse black holes, and that will be radio jets. So just as quasars, for example, as they're feeding on material, and they're getting this big accretion disk around them, the magnetic fields whipping around the black hole interacting with the disk, create these jets of material that come above and below the black hole. And you would expect something very similar in the early universe, you would expect to have these early black holes forming these accretion disks, 
building up these jets that would be appearing above and below the black hole, and it would be visible in the radio waves now that it's red shifted so far from our perspective. And what's kind of cool about this is that the radio waves should be able to penetrate a lot of the surrounding gas that would be obscuring them from our view. And so there might be a way to detect these radio waves. And if we did, it would be very distinct, it would be a very specific kind of signal that would be very different from any other radio source that we would expect at that time. What's the machine that can do this? Probably the square kilometer array, which is under construction right now. We probably won't see it until the 2030s. So we are within a decade of having the kind of telescope that could potentially gather evidence of these direct collapse black holes. And if that's true, then one of the major unsolved mysteries in cosmology, how did black holes get so massive so quickly is solved. It's pretty exciting. All right, you've probably noticed the Star Wars planet names above my shoulder. These are a way for you to vote for the questions that you thought were the best this week. Now last week, the winner was the question, why haven't we sent any updated modules to the International Space Station? And that was by JR. So congratulations, JR. Great question. I hope you like my answer. We made a good team. So again, at the end of this show, write down the name of the planet in the comments down below that you thought was the best question or the best question answer, or the one that most intrigued you, whatever was best, put that there and we will gather up all of the votes and we will celebrate that next week. Sergey. When galaxies collide, most of their masses merge into a new larger galaxy. This implies that there is some friction to slow down the individual masses, yet we expect few if any actual collisions of stars, which implies interactions will be gravitational and thus elastic. How does it turn into a galaxy if these things pass by each other? So when you've got these two galaxies coming together, say you've got the Milky Way and Andromeda, and they're going to collide. The stars themselves are so far apart that as the two galaxies come together, the stars are just going to pass right by each other. It's estimated there, there aren't going to be any collisions between stars in this merger. But the thing that will merge is the gas and dust that's in both of these galaxies that will collide in the middle and begin to heat up. And the other thing that's going to change is that the actual center of mass of the two galaxies will change, you're going to have all of these changes in the gravity of all of the stars. And so on the first run, as Milky Way and Andromeda go past each other, you're going to get all of these three body interactions with all these different stars, they're going to be careening off in new trajectories, They're not going to collide, but they are going to be sort of kicked off into new orbits, that they're now starting to orbit the collective mass of both of the galaxies, you've got the gas and the dust that's collided with each other and is adding to the mass that these stars are going to be orbiting. And that's just that first run, you know, maybe in 5 billion years, they first come past each other. And then they come back together and do another run and then more of these three body interactions and more of this material starting to pile up in the middle of this collection between these two galaxies. And eventually, after many, many of these flybys, all of the stars have settled down and adopted their new place in this new giant elliptical galaxy. And that's what giant elliptical galaxies are is the result of these mergers between large galaxies, after billions of years of them figuring out the new orbits and starting to orbit around the new common center of gravity. Daniel 6161. An episode of Star Trek got me thinking if we encounter intelligent life in the galaxy, how would we communicate time days, months, years are Earth centric? Would it be the decay rate of an element? This is a solved problem in science. And that is how do you communicate things like distance, time, weight, um, energy, etc. to someone if you can't just hand them a ruler and say, that's a meter or hand them a block of steel and say, that's a kilogram. How are you able to communicate this stuff? And there is something called the International System of Units or SI units. This is an international committee, it's been around for a long time. And they have agreed on seven basic standard units, which have their information derived from fundamental constants in nature. And so 
they are the second, the meter, the kilogram, the ampere, the Kelvin, the mole and the candela. And each one of those can then be used in larger formulae to be able to derive other concepts. But those are the sort of the foundation of our ways of measuring the universe. And so just to give you an example, the second is the duration of 9,192,631,770,000 periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium 133 atom. In other words, if the aliens are aware of the cesium 133 atom, which if they're flying in a spaceship, they probably are, then you can tell them that your un unit of time is roughly 9 trillion uh, oscillations of this cesium atom. And from that you can begin speaking a common language. And you can imagine, right? Like you send them a periodic table of elements and you point out atom cesium with the 133 isotope, and you then begin this conversation. And the meter is based on the speed of light and the mole is based on the number of atoms and so on. And so there's there are these fundamental constants in the universe that you can use to build up this conversation. KKGT6591. Hey, Fraser, what are other major areas of research being carried out in astrophysics, which are not usually in the news? News mostly covers things related to black holes, expansion of the universe, etc. Yeah, the, the problem with the mainstream media, I hate to use that term, but the problem with the mainstream media coverage of space news is that it is informed by science fiction. And so the topics that are exciting in science fiction, like aliens, black holes, teleportation, right, all of that kind of stuff, stargate wormholes, white holes, those are the kinds of stories that people want. And I think they're just looking for some kind of connection between what we saw in Star Trek and what scientists are discovering warp drives, when are we gonna find out about warp drives. But in the science community, those topics are not that interesting, because they aren't very tangible. And so not a lot of work is being done in those fields, although some is I mean, there's some there's some people who who do focus on those work, especially some of the big, you know, things like black holes, like a lot of people are researching black holes. But I think they've kind of crossed over from, you know, they're, they're very interested in science fiction, but they're also really interesting in just in terms of, of astrophysics. There are a few revolutions in astronomy that I'm really excited about. And I try to to share my enthusiasm for them. But the stories when we write them on universe today, they kind of flop. And that's too bad, because I think that that this is incredible. I mean, like, obviously, seeing stories about newfound planets around other stars, that's all really great. But the underlying methods that I'm really excited about, one is surveys, large surveys. And so in the past, if you wanted to view some target in the universe, you would book time on a telescope, you would then make your observations of that object, that star, that pulsar, whatever, and then you would write your paper, and you would produce your results. But now we have surveys, we have things like Gaia, we have the upcoming Vera Rubin Observatory, we have the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, there are many different surveys. And these surveys are just gathering all of the data, they are trawling the universe. And then you as a researcher, you don't have to book time on a telescope, you can just look at the Gaia data and produce your papers. And you can examine a 1000 pulsars simultaneously, which has never been done in human history. And yet now, with radio surveys and astrometry surveys, and so on, you can do that. So that's like the first pillar of what I think is the revolution in astronomy. The next one is this idea of time domain astronomy. And we are right at the cusp of this, really, it's going to be the Vera Rubin Observatory that's going to revolutionize everything, because it's going to be scanning the entire sky every couple of nights and spotting every single thing that the universe was doing when we weren't looking all of the supernova, all of the asteroids, you know, up until this point, astronomers have found about 1600 type one a supernova, which sounds like a lot, Vera Rubin will find a million, it's going to find 
thousands, tens of thousands of asteroids, it's gonna find comets, it's gonna find Kuiper Belt objects, it's going to find so many things. And so now, it's going to reveal this fresh layer. Imagine if all you could do to study the past was look at a picture, and someone was able to show you a movie of people walking around, it would be mind blowing. And the last pillar is multi messenger astronomy. And this is where you're able to examine objects in multiple ways of seeing in the past, we just had electromagnetic waves, you could see things in the radio, you could see things invisible and in infrared in x rays, but it's all just the same thing. It's just photons. But now with gravitational waves, we're able to see objects in both radiation and in gravity. And that is really exciting because it's a completely independent way to verify the results that you're making. And the third part of this is going to be when neutrino astronomy is able to be connected up with a lot of the same objects. Imagine you could see two neutron stars, the flash as they collide with each other, you detect the gravitational waves as they sweep past Earth, and you detect the burst of neutrinos coming from that collision at the same time. You got three independent ways to observe this. And it's provides you just an incredibly powerful way to examine things. So I think that that there are these there are these revolutions that are going on in astronomy, that it's a really hard story to tell. And I don't think that people who are science journalists are able to really kind of stay on top of how the field of astronomy has changed really just in the last decade, as all of these surveys have grown as gravitational waves have come online as neutrino observatories have come online, everything is changing. Ryan Schmitz, how do you come up with good questions for your interviews? Do you have a method or a process? A little uh, behind the scenes question here on the question show. So of course, I do these interviews every week, and I'm really proud of them. And I mentioned I think in last week's space bites, that they're my favorite part of the channel. And to be honest, doing the interviews are my favorite part of my job. Full stop. Like when I get a chance to be curious and ask all of my questions to experts, I'm in my happy place. To be honest, I don't do a lot of preparation for the interviews. There's a couple of reasons for that. Mostly lazy. Um, no, uh, I feel like me getting prepared for interviews is the result of almost 25 years of reporting on space and astronomy news. I don't think there's any, there's no fast way that I could get prepared to have a very in depth conversation with a subject matter expert in this kind of field. It had to have come from experience over writing hundreds, thousands of articles about about trying to explain this stuff myself and trying to really get a sense of where the limits of my knowledge are. And so when you're seeing me do these interviews with people, I'm right at the cutting edge of what I understand. I mean, I am asked, I am not asking them questions that I know the answers to. I'm specifically only asking the questions that I don't know the answers to because I'm trying to push my knowledge deeper and try to understand this process better. And I am so curious about everything. Like, I don't, I seem like I ask a lot of questions and I'm a curious guy. I promise you, you spend any time with me personally, you're going to feel like you just had a million questions thrown at you. I think I was like that as a kid. I, in fact, I know I was as a kid, I was relentless, and it never went away. And so I'm just curious all the time. And, and so I'm trying to get to the bottom of things. Um, I think as an interviewer, as you get better, as you mature, you learn to ask shorter questions, and you try to get out of their way and let them give the answer. Um, you know, a lot of of interviewers, I find will spend a lot of time asking the question, re asking the question, giving more of a preamble, presupposing the answer and then letting the person ask the question, or they'll just get clever and, and be, you know, sharing their stories, while they are listening to the interviewer. The other thing that I do and, and people will accuse me of interrupting a lot. And, and I think it's sort of important to explain that to justify that. So when I interrupt people, if you listen carefully, what you'll hear me do 
is state a bunch of information that tries to set the level of the conversation. And so if I feel like the person that I'm interviewing is explaining things too basically, that we don't have time for that, right? They're going to explain you know, the black hole is you know, no, we don't have time for that. And so I will ask a question or make a statement that shows the level of technical specificity that he, he or she is allowed to go into that I know that my audience can handle it. And so I'm trying to short circuit that whole process and get into the level of, of technical explanation that I know you want to hear. And so often I will I will interrupt and make some comment that will then try to sort of revise their where what level they're trying to ask the question or answer the questions at. But but no, I don't have a method. And I, I just follow my curiosity. And and so far, I think it works out really well. So one of the things that you might not know about universe today is that all of the content that we produce all of the words on universe today is available as a Creative Commons 4.0 license, which means that you can use our text for anything you like you want to write a book and include our text in it? No problem. Do you want to translate our videos into other languages? Go ahead. Do you want to create your own website and call it universe tomorrow and scrape all of our text? Do it. I dare you. So and the reason we're able to do that is because we are funded by our patrons. These are the people who provide us money. So we don't have to live off advertising revenue. We don't have to gate our content and we can release it as a Creative Commons license to the world. So this week, I want to thank Mark Kania, Mystery Crumble, Bob Moeller, Dennis Cope, Jacob Baker, Andrew L. Novak, Kevin Sullivan, Joseph Page, Eric Lotze, and Dennis Cope. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today and help us do independent space and astronomy news, being able to supply that information as widely as possible to whoever needs a little more space news in their life. Andrew Jones, say we start to find a vast amount of planets around red dwarf stars that have no signs of an atmosphere or possibly too thick of an atmosphere to detect anything at all. Will that data start to tell us that it is increasingly unlikely that there's going to be any signatures of life around those stars? Our search for exoplanets is still really in its nascent stages. I mean, we can't find that Earth 2.0, that Earth sized world orbiting within the habitable zone of the sun like star, we're going to need the next generation telescopes to be able to do that. But astronomers have found Earth sized worlds orbiting in the habitable zones around red dwarf stars. And that's exciting. And there's no reason on paper why these planets couldn't be habitable. I mean, they're at the point where liquid water can be on the surface of the planet, they have roughly the mass of the Earth, that all sounds great. But there are a couple of problems. The first problem is that red dwarfs, even though they are putting out the right amount of heat, they're not necessarily putting out the right kind of light. Most of their light is coming in the red end of the spectrum in the infrared. And so they're warming the planet, but they're not necessarily delivering the total flux, the photons that plants might need animals to eat those plants. So you might not get a really thriving ecosystem on those worlds. But the bigger issue, and this is the one that you're alluding to, is that red dwarf stars can have devastating solar flares. And the solar flares are roughly the scale of the ones you would have on a much larger star. But the planets are huddled up close to the star, and they're going to take a face full of plasma as the star is blasting out these various flares. And we're not entirely sure what's going to happen. But the one idea is that this is going to strip away the atmospheres of these planets. And, you know, you're asking like a deeper question, like, if a planet has no atmosphere, is it habitable? Well, Europa doesn't have an appreciable atmosphere. And yet, people think that Europa is one of the most habitable places in the solar system. Once you get below the ice, you've got this warm ocean beneath, and there could be life down there. So not seeing an atmosphere on a world doesn't tell you that the world is lifeless, but it does tell you that it is nothing like the Earth. Earth has a very thick atmosphere, Venus, even though it's inhospitable has a very thick atmosphere. 
we would expect a terrestrial planet that is in the habitable zone, if you do want to have that water on a surface, it's got to have some kind of atmosphere that is trapping in the heat and keeping the planet at the right temperature. So I think that if we studied world after world, and continuously found that none of these planets had atmospheres, then that would be a pretty significant case against the habitability of planets Like clearly these killer flares are destroying the atmospheres on these planets before they get a chance to get set up. And the life as we know it is probably not going to happen. But we don't have a big enough statistical survey right now. Like when you think about the James Webb Space Telescope, it's only been able to study the atmospheres of a couple of planets so far. They're nothing like Earth. But I'm pretty sure they've already observed the Trappist system and some other Earth sized worlds. So we're just waiting to hear about the data on that. And I can't wait to find out if they have atmospheres. Radis Norvagicus. Do you really think humanity will survive beyond the next 1000 years? I don't know. How can I know? How can anybody know? Um, I think human beings face a bunch of existential threats. There have been threats that we've always faced like asteroid impacts and climate change and super volcanoes like there's stuff that that Earth can throw at us space can throw at us. But then our technology is adding new existential crises. One is our increased technological dependence our, our interconnected Electrical networks makes us prone to dangerous solar flares. But the ones that I'm probably most concerned about are the ones where you've got increasingly powerful technology, which is accessible cheaper and cheaper as the years go by. And so like there's two main ones. The one of course is artificial intelligence that the cost to train GPT three was some number I don't know, in the 10s of millions of dollars, while you could train it now for an order of magnitude less, and then eventually you could train it for a few hundred thousand dollars. And eventually, you could just buy a computer that would train GPT three. And at that point, there were on GPT seven. And so you can imagine at some point, this computer can do something that is harmful to us and all of humanity. And then the other thing is biology that you can already print DNA. And you can imagine future researchers starting to come up with viruses and things like that. And once again, it's going to get the it just take a nation state, then maybe it takes a university and then maybe a deranged individual with a private lab is able to cook up their own personal microbe and unleash it on humanity. So I think that we do have a couple of fairly significant existential threats. And there's probably more <laughs> that I haven't even thought of. And and we don't know if we're going to get through this. But like, what else can we do? I mean, uh, we just keep going, we try to be as careful and aware of the threats that we face. We try to keep a positive outlook, and we try to make the world a better place and try to continue on. Um, Humanity has been around for a million years, it would be nice if we're only at the halfway point of this process. And we're gonna be here for another million more. But it species go extinct all the time. So that could happen to us as well. Alexander Lee, if Starship is successful, how much cheaper will it make payloads into orbit cost per pound? We're still not sure because at the time that I'm recording this Starship still hasn't flown. I've been predicting March now for I don't know the better part of a year. But I'm but we'll find out whether or not Starship actually launches in March. Now the current cost of launching payloads into orbit is a couple of thousand dollars per kilogram. Like say if you buy a flight on a Falcon 9 rocket, you're looking at two to $4,000 per kilogram to get into low Earth orbit. Depending on if you ride share and if you pay for the whole payload and whether you use you want to expend the booster and so on and so forth. In theory, a starship should drop that price down by a factor of 10 or more. So we will probably see with starship prices coming down into the multiple hundreds low multiple hundreds of dollars per kilogram, like we could see prices come down as far as $100 a kilogram, I've even heard as low as like $75 a kilogram. And like if that happens, then it's a total game changer, then 
Like that's cheaper than a space elevator. And what is it? It's just a giant stainless steel tube that's being welded together in Boca Chica. And yet these things could be launching and returning from orbit at a dramatic cost. When you add the low cost with just the launch cadence, like in theory, these things can launch multiple times a day, that you will empty out the entire launch manifest in a couple of days. And then I mean, the, the thing that's most exciting about Starship about a fully reusable two stage rocket is that we don't know what we will use this for. It's like we ne we didn't know what we were going to use personal computers for we didn't know what we were going to use smartphones for that when you have this kind of power when you have this kind of a dramatic boost in technology, then it makes new ideas that were previously impossible previously way too expensive, like asteroid mining or space power, or space tourism or all kinds of ideas suddenly these become viable. But then the most exciting part is the ideas that we didn't even know we wanted to have become viable. But I think it's really important to be skeptical and be more realistic about what this is going to turn into like in a perfect world, this thing will be launching every few days, it's only being refilled and away it goes again. And there's never going to be an accident. Everything is just great. But reality has a really harsh way of catching up and showing us what's true. And I can imagine that it's a lot harder, it takes a lot longer, it's more expensive that failures happen, and that the actual launch costs are maybe half price from current cost to launch to orbit, but not necessarily that 10 times less yet. But who knows 30 years 50 years down the road, we could see just the launch cadence increase the technology increase multiple competitors that prices really truly have come down significantly. And suddenly we are a spacefaring civilization. I'm excited. But I'm also a little skeptical. So we'll see what happens. Super Blasic. Hey there, I was wondering about faster than light and why science communicators don't emphasize its impossibility. It would be healthier for the public to not assume infinite resources. Have you watched my channel? <laughs> um, I mean, maybe maybe you're talking about other science communicators. But I think like the common conversation between science communicators and the public is science communicators say, when will I have a warp drive? And the science communicator says, a warp drive violates the laws of physics as we understand it. And the person who asked the question goes, Oh, but how can you be so arrogant as to say that we won't have warp drives and that you know, we just don't understand the laws of physics. And, you know, me as a science communicator, you know, like, I'm not going to be so arrogant to say that I that we know everything that that science has figured everything out. So you're right. So but then you kind of turn the question around. You're like, Okay, fine, right? If if you think this is going to happen, then you tell me you tell me when when warp drives are going to happen. And then the other sort of way this conversation goes is you say, Well, you know, like, it's it's not realistic, like we don't understand how this is possible. Like we, we don't even have like a way that you could do it just violates the laws of physics, we understand it. And the person will be like, come on, like, come on, like, but really, how would it work? And you're like, okay, fine, you know, like you bend space time. How do you do that? You have negative mass, where do you get that? I don't know, you just do. So science fiction has filled our brains with the things that should be possible that you kick into hyperdrive that you fire the wave motion gun that you um, that you step through the stargate that you teleport yourself you have faster than light communication, because it's a TV show and these things are convenient and they make telling stories easier and they're fun. Who doesn't want to go down to find aliens and they're just like us because they have the little ridges on their foreheads. The universe is weirder than we can suppose. And the laws of physics appear to be what they are. And the second we discover ways to outsmart the laws of physics, as we understand them, we'll let you know. And so I think that, you know, we're seen we who attempt to cool the conversation, we're buzz killers, right? We're ruining sci fi Christmas, people don't want to hear this, they want to hear warp drive when they don't want to hear warp drive never. It's a journey. 
and people show up on my channel. They're probably in the chat right now. And they're like, I want to learn about white holes and warp drives and, and, and parallel universes and all that kind of stuff. And I don't have a lot to tell you, but I have got a ton to tell you about quasars and, and, and clouds of gas and dust and binary stars and, and exoplanets and impact craters on Mars and dust storms and Kuiper belt objects and Oort clouds. I got lots of stuff to tell you about all that kind of stuff. And so you've got to decide whether you want to stick around and you want to have the conversations about the, the really fascinating, interesting stuff that is actually happening, or you want to talk about the stuff that probably will never happen. You know, that conversation ends pretty quickly. So I want to talk about all of the stuff that's happening right now. That's right around the corner. I want to talk about telescopes being merged together through interferometry. I want to talk about seeing the universe in new wavelengths that we've never seen before and powerful new telescopes that are coming online ways of detecting uh, the presence of organic molecules in nebulae, things like that. And for some people, they're into that. And for other people, their eyes glaze over. And if they don't hear warp drive, they just move on. Ba Ali, best no light pollution areas to see stars, any continents. I mean, really, you just got to go where the big telescopes are. Those are the best places to see the stars with no light pollution. So you can go to the top of Mauna Kea on Hawaii. You can go to the Atacama Desert in South America. You can go to the Midwest, Arizona, places like that in the US. The best place that I've ever been was in Australia. I was uh, actually I was lucky enough to speak at a conference in Australia and my wife and I rented a camper van and we traveled into the outback for a couple of weeks in Australia. And we got to these places that were darker skies than anything I've ever seen. And like, I can see the Milky Way from my backyard. I could stand outside, I can look up, I can see the Milky Way, but nothing ever anything like that. And maybe it's because it was very warm at night, which was nice in Australia. And maybe it was because the Milky Way goes straight overhead from where we were. And I was able to just like stare right up to the least the best seeing part of the sky and see the Milky Way and see the planets. It was it was it's an amazing event. And if you've ever had a chance to go to Australia or someplace in the southern hemisphere, and you can get away from the city, get out into the dark skies, and you will have a profound view of the universe. Apart from that, I recommend the dark sky finder map. There's a map where someone has overlaid the light pollution with various Google Maps. And so you can look around and find places near you where you can go and see some nice, truly dark skies. I pity the people on the east coast of the United States, people in Western Europe, like you're there's no place you can go. But for most of the rest of the world, there are places you can go to get away from the bright lights. John Hamilton, how do we know a black hole is spinning if nothing can escape it? Why is the information about its spin lost behind the veil of its event horizon? Shouldn't black holes therefore be spheres? We can detect the spin of black holes. And that's done through the interactions of the accretion disks around the black holes. So black holes when they're spinning, they twist up space time through this process of frame dragging and outside of the black hole, you've got this accretion disk. And so the black hole as it is twisting up the space time around it as it's rotating, it's allowing the accretion disk to get closer to the black hole than it would if the black hole wasn't spinning. And you can actually like look at a black hole, measure the distance of the accretion disk from the event horizon, and that will tell you how fast the black hole is spinning. All right, those are all the questions that we had today. Thank you everyone who asked questions in the YouTube comments as well as everybody who showed up for the live show. Don't forget to vote. Vote down in the comments down below for the question that you thought was the best. All right, we'll see you next week. If you want to stay on top of all of the important space news, join my weekly email newsletter. I send it out every Friday to more than 60,000 people. I write every word, there are no ads, and it's absolutely free. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash newsletter. You can also subscribe to the Universe Today podcast. There you can find an audio version of all of our news, interviews, and Q&As, as well as exclusive content. Subscribe at universetoday.com slash podcast, or search for Universe Today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A huge thanks to everyone who supports us on Patreon and helps us to independent. Thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, 
and the Galaxy Wanderers. And a special thanks to George, Jeremy Matter, Jordan Young, Tim Whalen, Dave Verbeoff, Josh Schultz, and Andrew M. Gross who support us at the Master of the Universe level. All your support means the universe to us.